Welcome to this Brennan Center for Justice event. The Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute affiliated with New York University's School of Law. I'm Ray Suarez, co-host of World Affairs, a national program produced by the World Affairs Council of Northern California and KQED, heard on NPR member stations. I'm also a proud graduate and happy to be here this afternoon. Grateful to our partner in producing today's event, NYU's John Bradamus Center, an advocate for civil debate in politics and public policy. A record 32 million Latinos were eligible to vote in 2020. The results raise a valid question. Is there a Hispanic vote? The myth of the monolith was always just that, a myth. But now that actual monoliths are showing up in various isolated spots across America, it's becoming even more apparent that, no, it's not a monolith. What can we learn from electoral outcomes in Texas and other battleground states like Florida and Arizona to better understand the differing interests, values, cultural histories of voters within this broad block? And what role does age, gender, location, and socioeconomic status play here? Before jumping in, I want to invite those listening to share your questions to the panel by typing them into the Q&A box down there. Let us know where you're watching from as well. And we'll try to take as many questions as we can during the program. Let me introduce our guests. Dr. Matt Barreto is a professor of political science and Chicana Chicano studies at UCLA and the co-founder of the research and polling firm, Latino Decisions. Dr. Sharon Navarro is a professor of political science and geography at the University of Texas at San Antonio. And for me, using both their titles, doctor was not a controversial choice to make. They earned their PhDs fair and square. Cristina Sinsun Ramirez is the founder of Jolt Action and Workers Defense Project and a former US Senate Democratic candidate from Texas. And Jason Vialba is the president and chairman of the board of the Texas Hispanic Policy Foundation. He's a financial lawyer at Foley and Lardner and a former Republican member of the Texas House of Representatives. Welcome to all, both the panel and our audience joining us from across the country. How Latinos vote is fascinating, worthy of serious study, and now that there are results, worthy of serious reflection by politicians and their campaigns, social scientists, and citizens. And so we begin. Matt Barreto, you're one of the keepers of the numbers. Uh, now that they are pretty much all in with the election more than a month in our rearview mirrors now, what do the numbers say and what do you make of them? Well, thank you, Ray. Uh, it's great to be on with you and always great to hear your uh, wonderful broadcast ready voice. Uh, I love doing events with, with Ray Suarez, our, uh, our leader in the community moderating. So it's a pleasure and thank you, Brendan, for hosting all of us. Um, the biggest headline for me is that what we're calling the big jump in the denominator, the total number of Latinos who voted. Um, the census estimates that back in 2016, that this was 12.7 million Latinos voted. All numbers are pointing to 16.6 million, almost an increase of 4 million uh, additional Latino votes in just four years. That would represent an increase of over 30% in a four year cycle. We have never seen that before. Uh, people are going to say, but didn't everybody vote at higher rates? The national electorate increased by 15%, one five. And so the Latino in increase was double that. And we saw that across the country. We saw that in Texas. And we saw that in Texas in 2018. There's a continuing trend of rapidly expanding and growing Latino vote. And I do think it's important to break it down, as you mentioned, geographically, by different ethnicities, by age and ideology. But the bottom line is that the Hispanic vote is growing, it's growing across America, and it is changing our electorate. And so we need to continue watching that to see what happens. Uh, in terms of the presidential vote, it was about a two to one vote uh, for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. That's what is expected and in line with historic uh, performance of the Latino vote. We think it was close to about a 70-30 split. Uh, there are differing numbers. There is no, uh, to remind viewers and, and those listening, there is no 
um, actual factual correct number. They're all estimates from different polls. We think when you look at the polls that are accurate of the Latino community, it came in around 70-30, which is quite consistent with what Obama was doing in 2008 and 2012. And uh, with that growth, not just a two to one performance, but with that growth, we can say the Latino vote was quite relevant in many, many states, most notably uh, flipping Arizona from red to blue. Uh, you say Arizona, but a lot of the coverage, and I, I want to emphasize that coverage is not always reality. It's just a, a mold that we press onto the soft clay of something like a vote. Uh, the narratives that were coming out of uh, election postmortems were that somehow Latino voters in Florida, quote unquote, had denied Joe Biden, Florida, had denied Joe Biden, Texas, as if there was some expectation uh, that they had to all vote a certain way or else they were denying him. Well, even in Florida, Biden carried the Latino vote, uh, certainly in Texas. Uh, what do you make of that kind of narrative? The, the constant drumbeat of underperformance that you heard uh, in the days after election day. Well, I think that it was set up with very unreal expectations by those from outside the Latino community who don't understand the complexities and the different segments of the Latino community. There was an expectation set up by non-Latinos that because of Trump's underperformance in 2016, which is what it was, it was an underperformance con uh, compared to previous Republicans, uh, and because of his comments that somehow he would get zero Latino votes. And that was essentially the bar that we were held to. Um, in fact, there have been uh, conservative and Republican Latinos for a long time. And George W. Bush, the former governor and then president, uh, got somewhere around the high 30s, 38%, we think are the most accurate revised numbers, but still an impressive performance in 2004. Let's not forget that. So these numbers are well below that. I think in 2020, what happened was that Miami came out early. There was so much attention on Florida that that by itself started to craft a narrative that was not reflective of the whole country. As you mentioned, um, even if Latinos had matched the exact Hillary Clinton numbers in Miami, uh, Joe Biden still would have lost the state of Florida because Donald Trump made inroads with white voters across the state of Florida as well. So it wasn't um, what cost him the state of Florida by any stretch. It's still interesting to unpack and talk about what happened in Miami and how that electorate is so different than other Latino electorates in Phoenix or the Puerto Rican vote in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. We didn't have nearly enough discussion about that. So I think the complexities are important, but that was an unrealistic standard, Ray. And I, and I think it was a mistake by many pundits to hold Latinos to some standard that if every single Latino didn't reject Trump, that somehow we were underperforming. And, and if you look historically, that 70-30 margin is quite consistent uh, with the Latino performance. Sharon, why don't you uh, bring us closer to Texas, what you see there, and especially uh, looking at women and young voters. Sure. Um, men and women certainly uh, have different views uh, from across the country and in Texas. In Texas, we tend to be a little more conservative, uh, but we're a little unique in that we're a larger state, both geographically and economically. And if you're a candidate trying to run in Texas, you have to take into account the regional differences. So what you uh, run uh, as an issue in the northern part of Texas or perhaps more the urban areas uh, the messaging has to be a little bit different along the Texas-Mexico border. Uh, at least with uh, respect to this presidential election, the issues that motivated the vo voters were the bread and butter issues, right? The economy, the job, uh, health care on top of the uh, voter minds here in Texas. The interesting factor uh, with Texas uh, was the younger generation. We saw their uh, political participation, at least within Texas, play out long before election day in the form of protests and uh, the civil rights and social justice type movements. But uh, you, you, there are a, a number of factors and variables that you, you have to take to, into consideration when trying to gauge the voter uh, and how to pitch your message uh, because Texas is just such a large state. There was so much attention on the Rio Grande Valley where President Trump did much better in 2020 than he did in 2016. 
But so much of that attention came sort of at the expense of how heavily the Latino vote came out for Joe Biden in Houston, in Dallas, in San Antonio. Uh, put these different things in context because they're all important to understand. Uh, but for instance, the vote in Dallas is much larger than it is in places like Harlingen and Brownsville. Sure. Um, you, the majority of Hispanics tend to reside along the Texas-Mexico border, but it's very sparsely populated. Uh, and if you want to, as a candidate, uh, get your message out in that area, you have to have a lot of time and money. Uh, if you are looking at some of the urban centers like Dallas, San Antonio, and Fort Worth, we did see some evidence of uh, some progressive, even democratic movement in the suburban areas that you would not have seen uh, in the past presidential election. So that is a movement towards uh, the, the Democratic Party or even the Progressive Party. Uh, but this state is a state where neither political party really takes an investment in the state of Texas or its voters. Uh, we are a low voter engagement state. We are a low information state. Uh, and that works to the advantages of either political party, given the type of race or the election season that they're running. Uh, in Texas, the southern part, it's, it's very conservative. Uh, they have their own views. It's uh, an economy that is sustained uh, by oil. And these are little nuances that you have to take into consideration when you're running as a candidate. Did Mexican-American voters in border counties deny Joe Biden the state of Texas? I want to say he denied it. I, I think he underperformed uh, a little bit uh, in Texas. We didn't see any movement from the Joe Biden campaign until the, uh, I would say, two weeks. We began to see people from the Biden campaign, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, come down uh, to the border area and other uh, surrogates coming down. And, and in Texas, when you're talking about Mexican-Americans, uh, they feel... Uh, go, like going out to vote for a candidate when the candidate comes to them. Uh, this sort of face-to-face -face interaction is still quite relevant here in Texas. And we, did, we saw it late in the game uh, when it comes to the Democratic Party. And the Republican Party succeeds in Texas by not engaging their voters or not drawing attention to the opposition. And that's what we saw here. I wouldn't say denied. I, I would say he underperformed when you compare uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign of 2016. Christina, tell us what kind of 2020 it was for JOLT. You use the tools of community organizing in the political sphere to try to get uh, grassroots populations engaged around issues and turn that into turnout. Did it work? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the things we've been hearing are really critical. What's, I want to first give people a perspective of Texas. What we have to understand about Texas is that if you want to harness the power of the Latino vote, you have to concentrate and focus on Texas. One in five Latinos in the United States live here in Texas. Back in 2016, um, after Trump won and I stopped crying, um, we launched an organization called JOLT. And I named it JOLT because I knew that if we harness the power of young Latino voters and got them out to vote, that we could be a shock to the political system not just of Texas, but the entire country. That is the power that the Latino vote has here in Texas. And while we did have some political pundits and the Republican party in our state want us to focus and zero in on a minority of Latino voters in places like Zapata County where we had a couple thousand people vote, the story that wasn't told is the political tsunami that is building with young voters and Lat especially young voters and Latina voters here in Texas. So we had 200,000 new young Latinos vote for the first time here in Texas. Huge turnout, especially in the metro areas. In JOLT, we have focused over the last four years on turning out the vote amongst young voters and Latinas. Why? Because Latinas vote at greater margins. We are the trendsetters in our community. At JOLT, we are an explicitly progressive organization and we wanted to make sure Latinos' voices were heard this election, and we saw huge gains with the Latino vote um, amongst young folks. I will say that one of the other things that's really critical and important as we look at Texas, people talked about Arizona and Georgia and how they flipped. Well, those were 10 years endeavors that were led by not parties or institutions, but led by community leaders and activists, organizations that invested when the party said you couldn't flip Georgia, when they said you couldn't flip Arizona. 
Um, organizers, activists are the ones that did the hard work over a decade of registering and mobilizing voters, especially voters of color, young voters, and making them see their political power. And that's what we're starting to see here in Texas. Those 200,000 new young Latinos that came out and voted. And here in Texas, every year, there are 200,000 Latinos turning 18. Demographics are not destiny to flip the state, but our state has been historically underinvested by all political parties, but now we are the largest battleground state. So I know that where I'm going to continue to invest my time and energy is with young Latinos, but especially young Latinas that will be key to changing uh, not just the political outcome of my state, but the entire country. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that underinvestment. Uh, from what everybody's said so far, it sounds like non-voters are a pretty influential part of the electorate. Is the party in a place like Texas that pays the most attention to non-voters going to be the party that owns the future? That's right. You know, here in Texas, the Republican Party, I want to remind people, has held power not with a mandate, but with a minority of voter participation. And they've enjoyed that low voter participation, but that is changing. You've had record-breaking turnout amongst Democrats and Republicans, a state that has 38 electoral votes and 36 congressional seats, um, and the second number, uh, the second largest number of electoral votes is going to be an absolute fight to determine the future of this state. I believe that it will go blue, but it also depends on Democrats actually investing in the Latino vote and investing in it everywhere. We cannot take the Latino vote for granted. Um, there needs to be investment in registration and turnout and also in the issues that matter to the Latino community. You know, in 2018, my organization did a survey of young Latino voters because this is where most of our power lies. We are the youngest ethnic group. And of the major states where Latinos live, Texas actually has the youngest Latino uh, electorate. So, um, we know that we need to be investing in young voters. And in this study we did about what are the issues that young Latinos care about? Well, they want healthcare for all. They wanna legalize marijuana. They want $15 an hour um, as the minimum wage. This is a very progressive agenda. And so you need a candidates and you need a party that's going to speak to the real deep economic pain that our community is in. 60% of Latinos make under $15 a year. And you need campaigns and organizations that are going to be culturally competent to lead to Latinos. So for example, at my organization, Jolt, we know that young Latinas are powerful. So we've already started organizing uh, quinceañeras across the state. I actually have our poster behind here for our campaign. Pa people probably remember the quinceañera protest that happened at the Texas Capitol a few years ago against SB4. Well, we realized that there are 50,000 quinceañeras a year in Texas. So now we have girls across the state previous to COVID using their quinceañeras to start registering voters in their community, getting up and making speeches about when that they turn 18, that they are going to vote, that they want to ask their community to vote with them. Because a quinceañera is about coming of age, duty to family and community. And that shouldn't one of those duties be voting to protect and honor all of the hard work that our parents have done for us. And it's a campaign that's really taking off using culturally competent strategies that speak to who we are and uplift the power of our community and our vote is how we will change Texas. Jason Vialba, uh, what did the election day results look like to you as uh, a former elected official, as someone who knows the state of Texas well, and as someone who's looking at these trends, the trends that uh, Christina has just been talking about? I think Christina and Matt are both exactly right. When you look at the aggregate across the country, the numbers were 70-30 around the country. But if you drill down into certain communities around the nation, particularly in Texas, we did see a shift towards more Republican type voters. I mean, for instance, in the Valley and in, even in Dallas and Houston and El Paso, we did see an increase in the number of people that identified as Republicans and voted for Trump that just didn't before. So you, that, that effect, that trend cannot be ignored. But Christina is also accurate in that we're growing as a people in Texas and our voting power is becoming very strong. 
And the result of that is that no longer can has the Hispanic vote be taken for granted. If you are a candidate and you're running for office in Texas, you must engage that community in a way that's never been done by Republicans or Democrats in the state. I think the conventional wisdom is that Hispanics naturally gravitate towards Democrats. And I think the numbers bear that out in the past. But if you look at what happened in this most recent cycle and in recent cycles around the country, you will see that there is a slight shift. Now, I know that the progressive agenda of organizations like JOLT may appeal to younger Hispanics. But if you go to the abuelas and the abuel abuelitas around the state of Texas, you find that what they care about are things like educational opportunities, jobs, the economy, security. These are the kinds of issues that resonated in the Valley. And it's largely the reason that President Trump was able to break through some of those uh, barriers that might have been experienced in the past. And so uh, if I were advising Republicans, I would say continue to, to push the message of economic opportunity and educational opportunity. If I were a Democrat, if I were advising the Democratic Party, I would say it's important to continue focusing on health care because that's an issue that resonates, but also to not take for granted the people of our community. And I think there was uh, some, some effect of that, that, that had an impact in this most recent race. As I believe Sharon pointed out, we really didn't see the Biden campaign come to Texas until the last month or so of the campaign. And did, Biden, did Latinos deny Biden Texas? I don't think that's an accurate statement, but I do believe that had Latinos been mobilized and engaged at an earlier point in time, that it would have been possible for Latinos to actually have won the state for Biden. And so I think that's important. I think that does uh, show us or suggest to us that Texas is certainly purple and trending in a direction uh, that can benefit Democrats. But uh, I do believe the, the Republicans did a good job this time of re-engaging and refocusing and getting their message out in a way that did resonate with the Hispanic community. Jason, uh, it's been mentioned several times now that demographics is not destiny. And you're absolutely right that uh, the Republican Party has a shot with older Latino voters, but the median age of a Latino in the United States is a full 10 years younger than the median age of an average American. Does that give you and your fellow Republicans something of an uphill battle, at least as we uh, digest in demographic terms, this big young generation? Well, after four years of Donald Trump, I don't call myself a Republican any longer. I cannot identify with Trumpism in any of its forms. But if I were advising uh, the Republican party in a post-Trump world, I would say, yes, uh, we have to do a much better job of reaching out to Hispanics in a way that we haven't before. What I've been talking to people about is to engage Latinos, not as a once every cycle uh, visit to the Valley or, or one, one uh, a party or uh, during the cycle, but to engage them as people, as individuals, sit on those front porches like George W. Bush did and talk to grandma and grandpa about what it is that they care about the most, really understand what's happening in the, in the women's community and in, and the, in, the, in the school systems in the Valley and really get a better understanding of how we can benefit the lives of these people in a meaningful and impactful way. And that's the way uh, to win uh, the votes of Latinos in Texas. Failure to do that um, you know, will put the Republican party as it stands into oblivion. And I think you know, that, that's a message not only for Republicans, but for also for Democrats who've largely taken that community for granted in many instances. And so I think both parties have a job to do to win the votes of Latinos in Texas. Christina, it looks like you wanted to respond at one point. Yeah, I think that, you know, people that aren't, I'm sure there's a lot of folks from different parts of the country that understand who Texas is. First off, you know, a lot of the depiction of who Texas is, people think of Texas as a state um, I'm half white, half Mexican. People envision my white grandpa dressed up as a cowboy for his whole life. But actually they should be envisioning a state that is majority young, brown, and black. That is who Texas is. And the Latino population resides everywhere. You know, there's a lot of focus on the, the Rio Grande Valley, but you have to understand that 
60% of Latinos actually lived in the five major metros and that 70 to 80% of them voted for Joe Biden. And even in the, in the Rio Grande Valley where there was some shifts, right? Only 15% of the Latino population lives there. And I do agree with Jason that we have to focus on the economy. This is actually where Democrats and progressives have an advantage when they speak to, in our state has a deep tradition of economic populism. Bernie Sanders during the Democratic primary also won the Rio Grande Valley hands down. And he won that because he spoke to the real issues that small business people face. He spoke to the issues of raising the minimum wage, of building a labor movement that could raise the middle class. Those are the ways you speak to voters because we're also talking about some of the poorest counties in South Texas in the country. There is a deep economic pain that you have to speak to and address. And I think people are looking for anyone that's going to invest and spend time with our community and really um, move the needle on the fact that Latinos have the highest uninsured rate um, in the country uh, here in Texas. The fact that Again, 60% of us make under $15 an hour. The fact that Latinos are the least likely to go to college because we are so afraid of being crushed by student debt. We can win on these issues, but we do have to actually spend time investing in the Rio Grande Valley and investing in Latinos every year. As someone who watches all of these trends closely and has covered politics for my whole adult life, there's a kind of frustrating disconnect when I talk to my activist people, they say, nobody's speaking directly to us. Nobody's investing in the Latino vote. No specifically for us. But then when you talk to the numbers people and you ask them, well, what are the issues that are really propelling uh, this community to vote? You get education, uh, lack of pay from work, that work simply doesn't pay enough for a lot of people, and housing and housing insecurity. Immigration, it's on the list, but it's way down the list. So when candidates talk about those issues, aren't they implicitly talking to these voters who tell public opinion researchers year after year, these are the issues that are important to us, healthcare, education, and wages. So when a candidate talks about healthcare, education, and wages, I talk to my activist people and they say, nobody's speaking to us. Matt Barreto, what's the problem here? Who's missing what point? Well, I think, you know, uh, all of the candidates are speaking about those specific issues. If you go back to the 2020 election, that's exactly what you heard all of the candidates talking about is how is the economy going to recover from, from COVID? How are we going to expand access to healthcare? Uh, and so part of this gets down to candidate specific attributes, how relatable candidates are, and I think populism. Uh, you heard uh, both Jason and Christina talk about that in Texas. You have to be relatable. People have to see in you um, uh, inspiration, the ability that you, that you are fighting for them. And I think that there are some um, opportunities to continue to hone those messages, especially economic messages. Uh, and make that connection. If people don't feel inspired or if they don't feel a connection to a candidate, whether it's a candidate for school board, state legislature, or president, they're less enthusiastic. So we, we need to have um, candidates who are directly relatable, who inspire voters to come out, stand in those lines and vote. And I think that transcends ideology. It transcends issue and party. And so those are the candidates historically who have done the best with the Latino vote sort of across. So that's something that everyone can work on. Uh, but I do wanna return you know, quickly to the idea of Texas uh, becoming more competitive. You heard Jason say it is becoming purple. And I think that's right. I would encourage people to take a, an overtime view. Don't overly compare 2018 and 2020. Those are different elections, but over time you had uh, Romney carrying the state by 16 points in 2012. You had Trump carrying the state by about nine points in 2016. And you had Trump carrying the state by five and a half in 2020. So for all of the talk of you know, what happened in Texas, it got a lot more democratic is what happened. It was not as close 
as the Beto O'Rourke Ted Cruz election. But those, again, that was a very candidate specific election. There was a lot of organizing in the background. Um, Beto had a, a campaign across all 250 plus counties. And he had a particular candidate appeal that perhaps held him narrow those extra three points. Uh, and so Texas is trending in that direction in presidential contests, including in 2020. It was an improvement by about four points over the 2016 numbers. And so those trends will continue. You heard Christina talk about the 200,000 additional uh, Latino 18 year olds who come into the electorate. Four years from now, that's about another uh, perhaps 800,000 eligible US born young Latinos in Texas who will be in the electorate. So things are changing. Yes, let's find ways to communicate uh, the message better. Um, from all perspectives and, and have the Latino electorate in Texas feel included and feel campaigned to. I think that will help. I want to um, nationalize this conversation since it isn't a webinar about Texas. Uh, we ought to keep in mind uh, Puerto Ricans in Hartford and New Haven, Connecticut, and Dominicans in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and Puerto Ricans in Allentown and Bethlehem. Uh, we ought to keep in mind that this is becoming in ways that it wasn't before a national vote. This is a vote that's gonna matter in Georgia, in North Carolina. This is a vote that's going to matter increasingly in Illinois. Uh, what does that mean uh, as campaigns deploy nationally, as people start to put together their short lists for 2024 and start to raise money and strategize about how they're going to run? What does it what marching orders do these demographic trends give to Republican and Democrats who see themselves as future national candidates? Jason, you have any advice? Well, I think the mistake that will be making by most Republicans that are running in 2024 is to think that uh, Trumpism is alive and well in America, and it very well may be for the time being. But I think people are looking for uh, newness and a freshness from candidates in 2024. So I would I would tell Republicans, look, be your own person and identify these trends on your own without focusing exclusively on what Trumpism means to the Republican Party. I think Matt seized upon this well. He mentioned populism. Populism and the way that Trump galvanized this movement uh, in the Valley and around Texas and really around the country with the boat uh, regattas and the, and, the, and the bridge barriers and all the different trains that they had, it just shows that he resonated because of the celebritization of, of the presidency. And I think that uh, is a way that uh, he was able to break through some of those barriers that were more fundamental and issue driven. And I think re the Republican Party, uh, at least if you watch the last 30 days or so, uh, seem to believe that that's the future. And they're going to follow Trump right over the, the ledge uh, into the ocean, it, it appears. Um, but I think that's the mistake they're going to make. If I were advising Republican candidates that are considering to run in 2024 uh, na nationwide, I would say, you know, here is an opportunity of a lifetime. Here are uh, people who, while not a monolith in their way that they vote, are definitely uh, in, are, are going to be uh, accessible through issues like the economy and jobs and, and healthcare and education. Uh, focus on that when Florida and Texas uh, and you know, start to run the table on the other states where, that you lost during this election cycle and, and win back Georgia, win back Arizona. Now, if I'm, if I'm advising Demo, De, the Democratic uh, candidates, boy, uh, what an opportunity here that we're seeing uh, from from candidates all across the country to go into places like Arizona and Georgia and Nevada and New Mexico and just continue to build the lead uh, that they have on on in those states. Uh, and if Texas and Florida come off the map for Republicans, Katie bar the door, it's over. Uh, so I would say that the way to do this is to really seize in and focus in on reaching Hispanics in a meaningful way in a way that we haven't done before and that's the 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 golden uh ticket uh, to win uh, the election in 2024. i'm going to start taking your questions in just a few minutes before i do that sharon navarro uh 
in the aftermath of the election, you would have thought like 80% of all Latinos in the country were in Miami-Dade. They are not, uh, for those of you who live elsewhere in the country. Uh, but the idea that Trump had swayed voters by using the threat of socialism, uh, the threat of left-wing economics, had swayed a lot of voters. You have to be careful if you're a candidate for national office uh, because a, a lot of young voters, and again, Latinos are disproportionately young, uh, aren't such great big fans of capitalism right now. It's not really working out for them so great. They are fans of the $15 an hour minimum wage. They are fans of uh, forgiveness on uh, student loans. They are fans of government aid in, in housing and so on, and a radical rethink of immigration law. If in the hopes of being old Latino voters who are suspicious of left-wing economics, uh, do you also run the risk of bringing to the polls uh, people you didn't intend to? Right. Well, it's interesting because uh, when you look at who came out to vote, uh, we got to remember that the, the young uh, really don't show up. I, I think it's important to educate them. I think it's important to get them registered to vote, but it's also incredibly important to tell them and educate them what they can do, how politics affects them. I teach at university. I teach over 600 students in one semester, and I can tell you that a lot of them don't understand how politics works in Texas. So while it is admirable that we register young voters, it's also important that we tell them what they can do with their vote, how they get the information, how they uh, make a distinction between misinformation, which is incredibly successful here in Texas, and uh, uh, you know the correct information. Um, so I, I'm not, you know, if, if I'm talking to a political candidate uh, or a female political candidate choosing to run in Texas, I'm going to tell them to know their district, focus on the messaging, because that's what was missed here with the Democrats. The Republicans controlled the message, they controlled the narrative. And it was difficult for the Democrats here in Texas, even though we had this populism support uh, to really take a step away from the defund of the police, right? That, that resonates with older, it resonates with the business community here in Texas. So yes, focus on the, on the young, um, get them to come out and vote, but there's a lot of other underlining factors in just registering them to vote. Christina, uh, the investment is said to be one of the real shortcomings, uh, that it is more expensive to bring out a first-time voter. It's more expensive to bring out a young voter. It's more expensive not only to get them registered, but to make sure in that interval between registration and election day, uh, you keep them engaged so they actually turn out to vote. The Democratic Party has not spent that kind of money because they haven't been sure that it pays off what would it be spent on if the money was there? If the Democrats said, look, we're going to go in hard, get those 22 and 24 year old uh, first time voters, non-voters, what would you spend it on? How would you get them to the polls? You heard what Sharon just said about no shows. Well, I, 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 I want to look at the history of the last two elections here in Texas. We, in 2018, my organization, along with the three other largest youth civic organizations, started to form a statewide alliance called the Texas Youth Power Alliance to look at how we could get to scale in registering and mobilizing young voters. We, uh, in 2018, because of our efforts, we saw a 500% increase in the youth vote. Again, in 2020, Texas went from uh, last, almost dead last in early youth voter turnout in the country to number one. And that was because of efforts that were strategically made to register and speak to these voters. If you wanna talk about Georgia and Arizona, key to flipping them has been focusing on two core constituencies that are often underinvested in and overlooked, young voters and voters of color. In Arizona, Latinos and Native Americans. And in Georgia, primarily the black vote, not exclusively, but primarily the black vote. All of that infrastructure was really created outside of the party for a substantial uh, um, decrease of what people actually think it costs. You're talking about several millions of dollars that made uh, real impact in registering and mobilizing young voters. 
The other thing I want to say is that, yes, you cannot depend on one constituency in the Latino community. You can't just depend on young voters. You can't just depend on older voters or Cuban voters or Mexican voters. What people need to understand is that the Latino vote um, is diverse and speak to the regional differences. You know, I've advised campaigns. I advised our previous Senate campaign in 2018 on the Latino vote. And people didn't understand the regional differences with the Latino vote here in Texas. For example, Ray, you spoke to the point that people oftentimes don't speak to the bread and butter issues of our community, that they only wanna to speak to them about immigration. And immigration is extremely important, especially here in Texas, because one in three Latinos, um, uh, or sorry, one in three Texans are immigrants or children of immigrants. But don't go to San Antonio and talk about immigration because it doesn't have a very large Latino foreign born population. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about what uh, Tejano is. Here in Texas and across this country, Latinos, we live in a duality that many of us are newly arrived to this country, but we always existed in these lands before the United States was even constructed. So you have to be able to speak to both of those experiences and understand when you're in Houston, who you're speaking to versus who you're speaking to when you're in Miami um, or Atlanta, um, just like you would with any other population. When people go and they spot, talk about the white vote in Pennsylvania and they're in rural Pennsylvania, they have a different message than when they're speaking to the white vote in urban Pennsylvania. Same thing with the Latino community and we need candidates to catch up to that. Yeah, I mean, if, if you um, had a panel that to discuss how the white vote is not a monolith, people would think you were a kook. Uh, mm -hmm. If we were to observe that white voters uh, whose ancestors came to this country from places as different as Ireland and Ukraine were somehow not a monolith. Um, you know, you might be met with Snickers, but 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 here we are. Uh, let me go to some of these questions, the terrific questions. NBC News reported that in the weeks before the November election, Spanish language misinformation about Joe Biden's positions on abortion specifically targeted religious Latinos on Facebook and WhatsApp. Several of the memes about these positions on abortion that were circulating were false. To what extent can targeted disinformation and misinformation play a role in swaying the votes of Latinos? I can- Sharon, you wanna take, take that? I can then jump Matt. in first. Uh, we did okay. some work on that actually. So um, the DNC had an extensive uh, uh, team that was monitoring on a daily basis what was happening in this exact area, uh, Spanish language misinformation and disinformation. It was quite extensive um, in right-wing circles, primarily in uh, South Florida, but in other circles nationwide, Facebook, WhatsApp, YouTube. Uh, and they were monitoring it and they were countering it. It was difficult because it has been in place for a long time and it will require continued attention uh, to get people to uh, come to the facts of reality. Uh, but it is something, um, I think the NBC News article is right in pointing it out, but wrong uh, in saying that it went unchecked. Um, you know, we would get daily updates on what was happening uh, from the DNC, uh, from their team who was saying, this is what we're seeing now, here's some possible ways to push back. And so um, it was on everyone's radar, but it was very deeply rooted, as I said, especially in Miami. And so that is something that there has been an active effort with misinformation and just uh, false, you know, edited images uh, to circulate those. And I think we have to question, do we want to go to that level? How do we root out those blatant lies? This is no longer policy debates that were happening. These are, um, you know, lies and tricks and, um, you know, I think that it's important to question and, and you started to see some social media start to address that, right? With Twitter putting, this is not accurate. This is being disputed. Perhaps some people want them to go further. Um, but I think we have that obligation and, and maybe even turning the tables back to you, Ray, I think how um, news and journalism has changed so dramatically from facts and information that people could rely on to just such that diversity there. So it is an issue. I think the Democratic Party is aware of it and is confronting it, but it is not so simple uh, as just sending out, you know, a piece of information and saying, hey, that's not true. Uh, you have to really get in there deeply to root it out. Sharon, anything to add? 
Yeah, I want to echo that. You know, the, this fake news and the infocalypse in terms of this misinformation that has been consistently worked on by the Republican Party has been successful. And it's the Democrats are aware, and we saw that here in Texas on the news and some of the Spanish language uh, radio, and it was difficult for the Democrats to try to flip the narrative, uh, to come out of, to construct or counter construct their own narrative. And that's something that the DNC, uh, even in the state has to really invest on how to target this misinformation, this infocalypse, the fake news, but that's something that is gaining ground with the development of AI and the ability for the common person to manipulate photos. I mean, if we look at our iPhones, you know, I mess around with my makeup on the iPhone. I sort of change my face. I've seen that. that yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, <laughs> that is the level of this misinformation that has to be uh, taken very seriously uh, by political consultants and both political parties to address. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Jason, as the realization that both parties might have a shot at capturing the Latino vote, or at least a share of it, takes hold, would Republicans be less inclined uh, to engage in the kind of uh, purges and uh, voter suppression efforts that we've seen in places like Georgia and Florida? If they thought, hey, we have a shot here too, would there be less of that uh, you know, the pull and finding it because in the last cycle, names been taken off the roster. I wish I could tell you that that was the case. I wish I could tell you that the Republican Party learned its lesson and that white hot rhetoric that's uh, anti immigrant, Im immigrant and, and separates children was not a popular theme running through Republican Party politics. But let's just be absolutely clear 70 million people voted for Trump in this last election cycle. They heard what he said about immigrants. They heard what he said about people of color. They heard what he said about Latinos. They saw what he was building uh, around the state of Texas. And yet they supported him, not in spite of it, but largely because of it. So I think Republicans, uh, at, specifically at the national level, are gonna continue to drive that uh, nationalist, that anti-immigrant type rhetoric, because it resonates with older Anglos who are the large, still remain the largest percentage of Republican Party voters. Now, the good news is that if you go down from the national level and look at the state house candidates and look at the county commissioners and the judges that are running, you're seeing a much more nuanced message. Uh, a, a great example is George P. Bush here in, in, in Texas, right? George P. Bush is land commissioner right now, likely to run for some office higher. And here's a person who stayed away from that rhetoric and has even called out other people in the party uh, for having those, making those kinds of statements. And he has uh, done but a good But he job. endorsed uh, Donald Trump for reelection. Well, I think that was sheer politics, right? I mean, in Texas, if you don't endorse Trump as a Republican, <laughs> you're looking at the result of that, right? I came out against Trump in 2016 and summarily lost my seat in the Texas House uh, in a very tiny, very uh, wealthy district in, in Dallas. And so it just didn't, ha it doesn't pay uh, to do that right now. But I do think that because areas like the RGV and areas like uh, Florida, Dade County, and areas around Arizona and uh, New Mexico and, and elsewhere, where you can really engage and talk about issues that resonate with grandma and grandpa, abuela, abuelita, uh, then you can make a difference and you can win those races. And I think we're seeing younger candidates do that. Smart candidates across the country are doing that who are Republicans, and hopefully they'll continue to do that. But I, I do fear that at the national level and in and in states where there just isn't a strong Hispanic population that we're going to continue to see the kind of rhetoric uh, that was so popular over the last four years. Uh, Matt, how significant a role will the Latino vote play in the Georgia Senate runoff? Uh, I What might we see in January? Well, you know, we already saw a historic increase in the number of Latinos voting in the state of Georgia in the November 2020 election. Um, it was much higher than anyone had anticipated. Georgia is another state growing 
by that younger Latino population. And we're expecting that uh, interest to continue. Uh, however, it is important when we look at the state of Georgia that we talk about the outreach and the information and the education. We're already hearing reports, not just from Latinos, but lots of voters that they're saying, oh, well, the election is over, or when is that election? Is it, I mean, it's in January to settle an election in, in 2020. So there needs to be, especially for voters that are on uh, the first time coming out to vote, we need to see much more outreach uh, and education. The, the state of Georgia uh, now has a large and growing Latino population and a Latino vote. Um, and with continued investment, that is a state similar to North Carolina uh, and other states in the Southeast that will continue to be what we'll call Latino influence states, that as that vote gets out, you won't be able to see Democrats win North Carolina or Georgia uh, you know, by those one or two percent margins, if not for that five percent of the Latino vote, uh, which contributed. So very important. But the outreach and education, we're still seeing lots of low levels of knowledge of exactly when is election day and what are the rules in Georgia. Uh, and for for first time voting communities, we need much, much more uh, outreach there. Oh, so if you want to spend money, that would seem to be the place where you want to spend it. Christina. Talk about the role of class in Latino communities. Do voters, young, old, see their allies, their fellows, their brothers and sisters in people from other communities who are of the same economic standing or the same ethnic identity? As you make a common cause with other people, are you more likely to do it with another Latino or somebody from some other community who is facing the same challenges you are? So, you know, the, the research that we have seen done, I think you can see in two areas, like one, how do Latinos most identify and build solidarity? And it's oftentimes by national origin. Um, so that's where some of our data and information lies. The other pocket is more research that has been done recently about race class narratives that move Latinos, that Latinos are a community that very much, we are a working class community. Um, we are a community that is disproportionately, as we mentioned, young. Another community that we didn't talk about, but is the fact that a huge portion of our electorate uh, uh, growth is coming also from naturalized citizens, um, most of who are also working class. And so that race class narratives that bring Latinos together to talk about the issues that we face for our children wanting a good education for them, wanting high quality jobs so that we can take care of our families enough, and that we are being pitted against one another by the powerful, the wealthy, and the elite, that that is actually how you are able to really build bridges amongst Latinos and other um, working class groups. And that Latinos are particularly open to that kind of messaging and language. I will say it is language and messaging that we need to see uh, candidates uh, utilize more and invest more in. The biggest thing that I think Matt also spoke to is that in our community, we have a huge portion of our community who are first time voters. And that is a tremendous opportunity. I also think about it in a way like a race, who's going to invest first in our community um, reach them with the core message, but also educate them about their power, how to influence politics. And um, so much of that I actually gives me a lot of hope that it's going to be, as a progressive, that it's going to be uh, the Democratic Party, because when you look at where our electoral growth comes from, uh, you know, we can say that young people don't turn out, uh, but young people are turning out, and that is where our power lies. And those voters have a very different vision for the country than we see today, especially under the politics of Trump. One very interesting question from one of our audience members, David, who writes, I am a Texan and know experientially that the Tejano vote is a myth locally, statewide, regionally, and nationally. And I've heard variations on this every day since election day. There is no Latino vote. Uh, because there is no Latino people. There are specific parochial, regional, and national origin concerns that motivate people more than this sort of pan-ethnic, pan-national 
identity. Uh, and our panel is very well placed. As, speaking as the only Puerto Rican on the panel, uh, and with a with a um, a Peruvian American and a couple of, a, a collection of Mexicans of different numbers of generations in the country, I think we have a good test group here to to test that idea with. Uh, so I'd like to hear from you all, Jason. What do you think? Well, I certainly think that. Um, you know, there's going to have to be a change in the way that we approach these voters, right? I mean, we've de we definitely have to move forward from the messaging that we've seen before and have to move on to the next uh, message that you've already talked about that has been addressed here. So I'm hopeful that we can continue to do that. I might have lost your signal just then. In fact, I did. Are you there? Keep going, Jason. You're there. Okay, I, lo I, I lost the signal and, and so I missed what you were saying. What was the question again? I'm so sorry. Is there a Latino vote? Well, I think there is a Latino vote in some sense, but, but David, your writer, I think is accurate. Look, we as Hispanics in Texas are interwoven into the very fiber and DNA of the state. As Christina points out, we were Texans before Texas was Texas. And therefore, because we're integrated into the state, uh, as a people, we identify largely with the general population of Texas. So I think his point is, is valid. Now, that being said, we do have a shared uh, community, a shared cultural history, even though we might come from different parts of the world or speak uh, Spanish at home and or English at home. The fact is, as Latinos in Texas, we uh, we know largely what, where we come from, and we are a fiercely independent people. We are people that are focused on issues uh, that we've talked about today. We do share some commonalities. Now, what those themes are, are for the candidates to figure out. But the fact is, if you look at the numbers, as Matt points out, 70-30 or 65-35 in Texas, you can find some, some trends. And those trends suggest that there is a Latino vote, but probably not. Uh, one that is as uh, identifiable as we might find, say, in the African-American community. Sharon? Uh, it is incredibly important to poll uh, attitudes and understandings of every group. And I would echo that about the Latino community. We have to know what they're thinking or what issues are important to them. And it is incumbent upon the candidate and the political party to craft the message uh, that will resonate with uh, that particular constituency. We have many constituencies, many types of different voters. Uh, we're not monolithic, but there is an important endeavor in understanding how and what makes people uh, go out to the polls. Christina. Uh, I believe there is strongly a Latino vote that's flexing its, its muscle, um, especially in this past election what people need to understand are the cultural things that bind us and what also makes us different. And it's actually not that complex. It's the fact that people haven't spent the time to understand who the Latino population is. The Latino population also is black, brown, and white. People don't realize that. The Latino population, again, as Jason said, some people have been part of the United States before the United States existed. Many of us are also newly arrived to this country. Spend time understanding the cultural regional differences. And then again, the trends. For me as a progressive, I know that the Latino population, especially here in Texas, that's highly Mexican, highly Central American, that they're voting for Democrats. That the Latino population that is young, that is female, that they are highly motivated to get out and vote, but they are historically underinvested in. So that in my mind is what I'm trying to change. And finally, I guess uh, as the principal of an organization called Latino Decisions, but I don't wanna prejudge your answer, Matt Barreto. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Uh, great question from the audience and uh, hello to all of my uh, Peruvian friends and family and followers. Thanks for the shout out, Ray. Um, you know, I do think that, and I think uh, Jason and I have a lot of common in how we might view this, that there is overwhelming uh, consistency and commonality in the Latino American experience. Whether your family is from Peru or whether your family is fourth generation in Texas, uh, Hispanic, there are cultural commonalities. We see that in public opinion data all the time. Latinos do think that we can relate to each other. 
that doesn't mean our politics have to be the exact same. And, and so there is such a thing as the Latino in America, the Hispanic in America, that exists. We do have commonalities, but yes, we have differences and we also have different political viewpoints. I think what you're finding is that that was finally discovered in this election. And many of us, I think yourself included, Ray, we've been talking about this for a long time and understanding those intricacies. And I hope that continues because I hope that brings more attention to how you speak to Latino voters across the country and understand their different communities. Well, thanks to our terrific panel of experts, Dr. Matt Barreto, Dr. Sharon Navarro, Cristina Tsinsun Ramirez, and Jason Vialba. Great to talk to you all. And we're grateful for your time and the work you do. Thanks for the partnership of New York University's John Bradamus Center for collaborating on this program. I'm Ray Suarez. Thanks for coming to this event and supporting the work of the Brennan Center for Justice. See you next time.